I can share. Yes, you can share. Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to this session on the Antarctic Treaty System and International Law and Governance from this CAR 2022 uh, conference. Uh, I'm Alejandra Mancilla, I'm Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oslo, and I'll be chairing this panel with Patrick Flam, who is a researcher at the Peace Research Institute in Frankfurt. And we have uh, eight speakers and only two hours, so we will be very, very strict with time. Uh, we have allotted 12 minutes for each speaker, and I'll be keeping the time here, and an alarm will sound, and with that, when that happens, <laughs> we will turn to the next. So we have time uh, at the end for quick fire uh, questions and answers. Uh, Patrick will be keeping uh, track of the questions in the chat, so you're welcome to post questions in the chat uh, as the uh, sessions go, uh, um, as the presentations go. Uh, I think that's it with the uh, housekeeping rules. I don't think I'm missing anything. The session is being recorded uh, and we still cannot see you, but at least we can see your presentations. Um, so I guess we will just uh, start as it is and maybe later you're, uh, you will hopefully appear and the video will work. We'll leave that to the IT uh, organizers. Okay, so our first uh, session, uh, in the, our first presentation today is cold play and hot talk. Could the dynamics of Antarctic treaty system change with the moves of non-original signatory states and new entrants? And Hyung Chul Shin from the Korea Polar Research Institute is presenting. So Hyung Chul, uh, the floor is yours. So, Good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Hyung Chul Shin from Korea Polar Research Institute. I mean to have it as concise as possible. And it's not quite um, refined, fully baked, but I wanted to share this thought. So rough outline is Antarctic Treaty System and the members in tradition. There are disagreements, but it seems they're evolving. And there may be causes proximate and distal. And how to do this, uh, how to deal with it or what to do about it, well, we can do horse trading or fair deal. And there are some wrapper points. Now, this is just a photo taken from the most recent ATCM in Berlin. I was there as a member of the delegation, but it's just a somewhat independent view. This ATCM was a little extraordinary, not 100%, but nearly business as usual meeting after a couple of years. What happened in the meantime, there was obvious global health crisis and there was a unilateral action across the national border, far away from the treaty area. Those two things singly or together brought about much, much lower and delayed scientific activities and interactive dialogue was interrupted and paused. And this led to deflated international cooperation, which in turn had obvious impacts on the two key pillars of the treaty, peace and science, obviously. Makeover, ATS family on a change. Now there are 54 countries that have acceded to the treaty since 1959. 29 of them are consultative parties, 25 other still being able to be invited to attend the meetings. When it comes to the environmental protocol, 42 countries acceded to it and promise to live by it. And some parties are quite new and they actually came after new millennium 2000. Now, as I said, there are some vague signs, more noticeable from 2022 this year, but the sign was already there as I thought. And cooperation tradition may be quietly shaken and there is a, a sign of return of old fashioned power games. Now, strength is on some parties becoming more solid. There may be some blocks forming, but this is again, 
my view. If, if you say there are disagreements with different views, maybe two lines, different views and interpretations on some of the ATS articles and basic stance on conservation issues, I will be try to be careful not to name individual countries or individual instant, but out of these two uh, lines, maybe examples like assigning decisions on managed and protected areas associated and applicable measures. That the, this one example that I can think of began from 2013. And MPA acceptance and stance on protection status of some species like that. And what are the causes? Uh, maybe bigger presence and stronger voice they want or immediate economic interest maybe behind or protection of future opportunities, however likely or however unlikely. Again, uh, if I can just say two lines of thought, um, so more fundamental, more distal causes, upheld entire tree itself or tree system and national agenda well agreeable along the same logic for some parties or for some countries. For other countries, upheld treaty and national agenda not automatically converging. In other lines, um, some parties may be able to buy conservation more dearly over harvest and other, other parties or other countries just cannot afford the idea of having harvest penalized, this kind of concept. It's very difficult. It may be difficult for them to live with. Now, these two lines may be um, by, taken by similar countries or, 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 or same sort of countries. Now, if I just pick up the, one, the first line, Strengthening ATS to con may, should be able to help them to confirm the status in the Antarctic community. Uh, for this part, for this group, mostly original signatories, but not always. And they may have solid views on sovereign issues. For other countries, other states, strengthening ATS to help the general stature of the country but not automatically to confirm the share in the Antarctic community. Um, who are they? Um, not necessarily all original signatories, mostly latecomers, but the composition of these states could be very diverse. And for other uh, causes, causes this, this is a misprint, can afford by conservation over harvest, they are more likely only investor and if they can offer the idea of having harvest penalized, they are most likely latecomer and sometimes more with economic aspirations. Now, I, I am very much against the grouping some countries in a uh, one-sided way. So blanket throwing grouping is not something that I can advocate because the third type of group can always exist. But one good thing that I can think of this phenomena is, well, anyway, you can actively talk to each other. You can just say your view. But I would not want to see repeating international discord in unlikely places, like place of peace and science in the Antarctic. Now, what to do? Um, log rolling or, or bargaining to simply ease the lock can become something like horse trading. However long it take, one should be working toward a fair deal, rational dialogue. And it will be 
remiss of us to miss out on uh, sustained and reactivate, re reactivated dialogue, uh, respect for science and collective wisdom should be maintained. Um, for example, um, I commented on protection status of some species. For this particular case, that was much talked in the last ATCM. This issue came to the table last year, somewhat officially on the table in the form of a scientific paper that went through some process. Whatever you may want to say, you should not lose respect for science generated in this manner. Now, this is my last uh, slide. I think there is some risk if left and if not taken care of. What will happen? Well, there will be more stalemates on further proposals on MPAs and other things. For whatever the reason is, if the partnership is impaired among the members of the Antarctic family, that will be in no one's interest and that will be wish of none. That's how I would like to conclude. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And perfect timing, even before the alarm rang. So that's very yes, good. Thank you. I mean to take have it just for 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Very good. So I've been told by the Sky ID team that uh, speakers can turn their videos on. Uh, so that should work for all of you, according to them. Uh, we'll move to our next speaker, uh, Hugo Moraes. Uh, from the Federal University of Pernambuco, and Hugo is presenting on the evaluation of the effectiveness of the Antarctic Treaty System for environmental issues, a case study of the Madrid Protocol. Hugo, the floor is yours, and the 12 minutes are sacred. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Hugo. I am a biologist, but I'm also undergraduate, and I have a master's degree in political science, and right now, I'm a PhD candidate in political science at Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil, where I conduct my research on Antarctic geopolitics and international environmental agreements. Uh, this research that I will present here was conducted by me and by my professor advisor, Andre, Andre Steiner, and it's entitled Evaluation of the Effectiveness of the uh, Antarctic Treaty System for Environmental Issue a case study of the Madrid Protocol. So um, since uh, we have just 12 minutes, I'll go straight forward to the most important things of the paper. And later, if you are interested in this topic, we can schedule a conversation and my email is on the slides. Um, well, the, the Question that the questions that motivated this research were if the Madrid Protocol is effective to protect the Antarctic environment, and if so, or if not, which institutional tools are influential in determining the level of its effectiveness. Uh, but first of all, we have to uh, define what effectiveness is. So I adopted this definition that uh, an effective regime is one that has the power to solve the problem in evidence, provoking changes in political behavior in line with the objective of the agreement and whose results can be measurable in, when compared to some benchmark. Uh, this definition is in line with the framework that we adopted when we decided to conduct this research. The framework was designed by Edward Myers and his colleagues, and it's described on this book, Environmental Regime Effectiveness, a conf Confronting Theory with Evidence. Um, these are the variables that and the elements used to assess the effectiveness of the Madrid Protocol. 
we have three independent variables uh, and each one of them is composed by a sort of elements. First, we have the type and structure of the problem, which is, is composed by the ma malignancy of the problem and the state of the knowledge. The scientific literature says that if the environmental problem in evidence is difficult to find a solution, the cooperation among parties tends to be hard and tricky. So the effectiveness of an environmental agreement to tackle this problem tends to be less effective. Or if the solution of the problem is easy to find and the cooperation flows is smoothly among the parties, the environmental agreement tends to be more effective. Uh, about the state of knowledge is more known, the more is known about uh, the environmental problem in evidence, the more effective the agreement tends to be. And the opposite is also true. I won't explain every single one of the elements because I have just 12 minutes, but just for the record, I also investigated if the issue uh, of preserving Antarctic environment has a link with other problems, if the parties involved are interested in other things than preserving the Antarctic environment, how the parties spread the need of preserving the Antarctic environment uh, domestically, how the institutional arrangements of the CEP works, uh, the level of integration of the epistemic community interested in Antarctic issues and other environmental problems, how the distribution of power works within the CEP, uh, the level of political skill and energy that the parties apply to solve environmental issues in Antarctica. And finally, if there is uh, the occurrence of some kind of leadership among the parties regarding environmental issues. Uh, uh, the data for this study were collected at the Antarctic Treaty Secretariat website, where I read every document provided since 1961 until 2019. Uh, I also did interviews with key actors like ATCM and CEP's staff, uh, countries delegates, Antarctic Treaty Secretariat staff, researchers, and experts. And of course, I read a lot of published papers, and I also did a participant observation at the 2016 ATCM CEP hosted by Chile as a member of the Brazilian delegation. And uh, here is the summary of the summary of the summary of my findings. Uh, in this table, you can see uh, the variables, uh, some characteristics found, and the impact of it uh, of it in on the on the effectiveness uh, of the Madrid Protocol. The plus sign represents a characteristic that enhances the effectiveness, and the minus sign is a characteristic that decreases the effectiveness of the Madrid Protocol. Uh, about the malignancy of the problem, we have found that, yes, the parties are very convinced about the fact that they, that they do have to protect the Antarctic environment, but do it is not a simple task. In addition, the Madrid Protocol does not have a robust uh, regulatory mechanism to watch the level of implementation of its guidelines, and this creates incentives for uh, an in inadequate inadequate uh, implementation by some parties. About the state of knowledge, we have a high production level of uh, scientific information regarding the protection of the Antarctic environment. But despite that, there is a lot of uncertainties about environmental issues involved in Antarctica yet, like the effect of, of climate change, for example. Uh, about the dissemination of data, AT, uh, the Antarctic Treaty system has a very uh, efficient system. However, some parties do not provide some information about their activities as recommended by the Antarctic Treaty. Um, about the uh, about the political uh, context variables, every observed element and characteristics had a negative impact uh, on the effectiveness of the Madrid Protocol. Uh, there is a huge overlap of environmental and political issues in Antarctica decision-making processes. And despite the fact that there is some specific instruments to deal with human activities, the protocol itself generalizes these activities, which makes it difficult to take some of that with more emphasis and energy. 
We also can observe the difference between the speech made at the meetings and the real implementation of some activities by some parties. About the ulterior motives, there is a clear and very apparent presence of hidden agendas behind some countries' motivations in protecting the Antarctic environment. This is very bad for the effectiveness of the Madrid Protocol because some countries are more interested in promote these secret agendas than to preserve the environment. And some cases are very iconic, but I will not address it here. And uh, about the domestic visibility, unfortunately, we have a strong sectorization of the Antarctic knowledge. It's very common that the fact that only Antarctic researchers uh, and decision makers knows about Antarctic issues. And uh, to finish the evaluation of the uh, of institutional arrangements shows that the Committee for Environmental Protection inherited the function of the ATCMs, which is good. It's a good thing because ATCMs are promoted since the 60s, and so the rules are very well known. But the consensus rule may delay some important decisions. And about the epistemic community, there is a strong presence of researchers in national Antarctic programs and also in internal spheres of the CEP. And today we can see a good level of integration of Antarctic researchers and decision makers joining other important uh, environmental forums like IPCC, for example. Uh, about the distribution of power is very clear that some countries are stronger than others in decision-making processes. And here I'm talking about the 12 original signatories of the Antarctic Treaty. About the political skill and energy is very good. The fact that the Madrid Protocol is operating for more than 20 years because the rules of the games are very well known. But we, uh, we can see that some parties are more involved with the protection uh, of the Antarctic environment than, than others. And at last, the occurrence of uh, protagonism of some uh, active countries that the scientific literature called pushers can be very good because they can stimulate other parties or other parties to do their best too. And well, after all, all uh, that was said here and a lot of other things that I didn't, that didn't fit in this 12 minutes presentation, the Madrid Protocol has, has a mixed performance in protecting the Antarctic environment from human activities. This assessment is due to a combination of a set of well-evaluated variables and bad evaluated variables. Uh, the, complete, the complete study also considerates the uh, three counterfactuals, uh, one with the scenario of the perfect implementation of the Madrid Protocol, one with the, uh, with the complete absence of the protocol, and one with a scenario where uh, the Convention on the Regulation of Antarctic Mineral Resources was in place but I can show it in a future opportunity. So uh, this is uh, the institutional, uh, the institutions that made this study possible. And here is my contact again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Hugo. Well, that again was perfect timing. So we're even running ahead of schedule, I've just noticed, but <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. We'll have a few more minutes for the Q&A at the end, hopefully. So our next speaker is uh, Charlene Fechter from the Helmholtz Institute for Functional Marine Biodiversity. And Charlene will be speaking about water stakeholders' interests in the Weddell Sea, an analysis with focus on the Kamalar Marine Protected Area proposal. Charlene, are you ready? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, I will share my screen. Unfortunately, I cannot turn my camera on. I don't know, I think my camera is just broken. <laughs> Um, but anyway, can you see my screen? Perfect. Okay, so um, hi everyone. I am Charlene and I am from the Helmholtz Institute for Function Marine Biodiversity in Oldenburg in Germany. And I want to show you my project about stakeholders' interest in the Weddell Sea. And this is an analysis with focus on the Kemmler Marine Protected Area proposal. Um, so, so um, just to give some background information for those who doesn't know about the topic, um, the Weddell Sea Marine Protected Area 
is proposed for the planning domains three and four in the Southern Ocean. In 2016, Germany submitted the first proposal for the establishment of the MPA. And since then, until today, there have been long lasting negotiations between Kimmela member states. And some of them raised concerns about ecological situation, scientific research, is the best available science was used, political questions, and the economic potential of the region. In 2019, the MPA planning area was separated into two, phase one and phase two. You can see it here on the picture, um, where the will see MPA um, is planned to be located and which part is proposed to be phase one and phase two. The leader of phase one is still Germany and the leader of the phase two is Norway. Um, but to date, there is still no consensus on the establishment of the real CMPA. And because of this, um, this project aimed to identify stakeholders of the Weddell Sea and their interest in the region. In the end, the goal was to evaluate if those interests or the number of different interests affect reaching consensus. The objectives of the project were to understand the process and the current status of the Weddell CMPA to identify stakeholders and their interests and to analyze the correlations between those interests and influences on the decision-making process. As methods, um, we use social science approaches like online research, secondary literature research, political document analysis, and those methods were used to identify stakeholders of Antarctica in general. Um, 116 stakeholders have been contacted via email to be part of an online survey. And those stakeholders were, for example, governments, NGOs, universities, uh, fisheries, um, scientific institutes. And um, yeah, the identification of stakeholders and their specific interests in the Weddell Sea in specific were approached through this online survey. And the results of the online survey and political documents were further analyzed um, through in vivo and analytical coding and statistical modeling with um, the software JUMP. The online survey itself um, consisted of 15 questions and the results focused on three main questions. Um, the first, do you consider MPAs in general and in the Southern Ocean as an effective conservation measure? The second, uh, is it more difficult to establish an MPA in the Southern Ocean than elsewhere in international waters? And the third one, what are your interests in the Weddell Sea? The questions were designed as multiple choice, ratings, or free text comments to have quantitative and qualitative data. In total, 43 stakeholders participated in this online survey, which means a response rate of 37%. Um, and those stakeholders were 16 Campbell members, one exceeding state, two non-members, and four international organizations, and some more. Yeah, um, the results were based on three categories, on effectiveness of MPAs, difficulties in establishing MPAs, and interest in the Weddell Sea. So um, regarding the effectiveness, stakeholders agreed that MPAs are effective are an effective conservation measure. As you can see on this figure, um, you can see on the left, the countries that have participated in the survey and we only focus on the two questions which are in the red quarter. And the ratings show that an average rating of 4.4 out of five, where one means not effective at all and five means completely effective. And as you can see on the next figure, um, those are the free text comments results. Uh, those show that stakeholders agreed on reasons for or against effectiveness. Um, here you see um, on the category, this uh, are the reasons that were mentioned by stakeholders and those, um, uh, those reasons were categorized. So, and we have the frequency what means that um, so many stakeholders mentioned those in the free text comments. And most stakeholders said that MPAs are needed to provide protection for ecosystems and biodiversity, but that they still need improvements in regulations and management. 
and fishing, economic, tourism, and political interests are factors that lower the effectiveness of MPAs, as well as climate change does. So regarding the difficulty level of the establishment of an MPA in the Southern Ocean, stakeholders seem not to agree on a general opinion. As you can see on the same figure, but on the right side, um, there's a broad range of weighting. You see that the, this, this is not a clear picture as the effectiveness questions show. And the average rating shows a number of 3.3 out of five, where one means not more difficult than elsewhere and five much more difficult than elsewhere. So stakeholders do consider the establishment in the Southern Ocean slightly more difficult than elsewhere, but as you can see, yeah, this is not a clear picture as the effectiveness. However, the free text comments show that there's an agreement on the reasons for difficulties. Most stakeholders said that reaching consensus per se is very difficult if many members with different interests come together. All want to have a piece of the cake and all want to represent their interests. The geopolitical situation and especially the member states China and Russia have been named to be responsible for blocking several efforts to reach a consensus. And other reasons are fishing and economic interests. And also territorial claims and the remoteness of Antarctica have been mentioned to lead to difficulties. The results about the specific interests in the Weddell Sea show that all of the stakeholders that have participated in this project have more than one interest. Overall, almost all member states are interested in scientific research and more than half member states are interested in conservation and rational use which is here defined as fishing, tourism, and natural resources. Um, to have specific numbers, 42% of stakeholders are interested in fishing, 31 in politics, and 26 in tourism. As you can see on the world map here, there's a great distribution of member states being interested in the Middle Sea, but unfortunately not all member states have participated in the study. Um, however, each continent is represented and shows the, this shows the importance of establishing an MPA in the Middle Sea, but also the difficulties in reaching consensus among so many stakeholders and interests. And yes, yeah, the map also shows the specific interest of each member state. In conclusion, it can be said that the number of stakeholders with a variety of interests seem to be the main reason why a consensus is not possible. Especially the question about rational use versus conservation seems to hinder any agreement as some member states see economic potential of the region as more important as the protection of the region. Geopolitical disagreements and territorial claims are also reasons why this is difficult in general and long negotiation processes such such as in the establishment of the Rossi MPA, for example, or the planning of the East Antarctic MPA confirm this. So um, there are still remaining questions on this topic. Uh, will there be a little CMPA in the future? Will this year maybe be the year when consensus will be reached at Camilla? Is it possible to find compromises among member interests? Yeah, but for this more studies and of course, compromises among member states are needed to answer, answer those questions. I thank you for listening. And um, this project was conducted as a master's project in collaboration with the Eiffel Wegener Institute in Bremerhaven and the Helmholtz Institute for French American Biodiversity. And me and my supervisors, Dr. Kim Molly Peters and Dr. Thomas Bray are also part of the German delegation of Kemmler. And this, uh, project will be submitted for a scientific paper uh, in a few weeks. So I'm happy to answer questions in the end. Thanks a lot, Charlene. Uh, where am I? Here I am. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And we're doing excellently with time. Um, so I hope we keep going that way. Our next speaker uh, pre-recorded uh, his presentation. Uh, it's Andriy Fedchuk from the National Antarctic Scientific Center of Ukraine, and the paper is titled Antarctic Science Under Unprecedented Pressure, the first common efforts to counter Russia's aggression against Ukraine under the polar legal regimes. Uh, so hello, everyone. I there it to is. Record. So we can. Oop. 
Oops. Uh, we're supposed to have the pre session. Hello, everyone. Session. I have to oh, record sorry. this presentation in advance because the siren of the aerial alarm could interrupt me at any moment. That's our new reality in Ukraine. So, my name is Andy Fetchuk. I am a human geographer and I have worked for Ukrainian Antarctic program for the long time. Together with my colleagues, I would like to examine the first common efforts to counter Russia's aggression against Ukraine under the polar legal regimes, especially the highest annual international forum for the Antarctic governance, Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting, which was recently held in Berlin. So, the reason of this study is ongoing Russia's full-scale military invasion of Ukraine started in 24th February this year. International reaction to this has been swift, resulting in the overwhelmingly supported the UN General Assembly resolutions and broad range of individual and collective actions and sanctions. At first, it could be heard reflections that ATSM should steer clear of any position in relation to the invasion of Ukraine. That the great strength of ATSM has been its ability to avoid contentious issues, which have enabled parties to circumvent conflict, exemplified by the instance of the Falklands Malvinas War in 82. This was the first case of armed conflict between two decision-making states under the Antarctic Treaty. However, this is a poor analogy as shown in this slide. At the time of that war, ATSM were held biannually and in the year of Falklands War there was no meeting. Moreover, a conflict itself was a regional warfare related to dependency and not to the metropolitan territory of either state. In contrast, the Russia's war against Ukraine was not of the same scale as in the South Atlantic. There is really a threat to extinction of the invited states, civilian casualties, refugees, threat of the use of nuclear weapons and challenge to international order in general. Moreover, there is considerable attention among both the Arctic states and Antarctic treaty parties, and, what is more important, significant impact on Ukrainian Antarctic program itself. Let's consider that more in details. What are the main consequences of the war for Ukrainian Antarctic program? First of all, due to the military aggression of Russia, the budget of National Antarctic program was considerably sequestered. The marine research program of the recently purchased research vessel Noosphere, former James Clark Ross, was also reduced. And uh, the return of the vessel back to Ukraine is now not possible. In addition, native cities of polar scientists living in the eastern parts of Ukraine were destroyed, and scientists have been placed at risk or became displaced by this war. In occasion of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, seven Arctic states decided to pause in all official meetings of the Arctic Council, which Russia currently chairs, and its subsidiary bodies as well. The similar decisions were made by Arctic-related international organizations such as International Arctic Scientific Committee and University of the Arctic, with uh, further practical actions. Even the European Commission decided to suspend the cooperation with Russian entities in field of research, science and innovation. Such situation caused a wide resonance in society, could not be unseen by the Antarctic Treaty parties too. The recent annual Antarctic Treaty Consultative Meeting hosted by Germany was notable due to the diplomatic trials as both states, Russia and Ukraine, are decision-making treaty members. Nevertheless, actions at the open plenary of ATSM 
is also about contributing to the global signaling that Russia's behavior is unacceptable. It is remarkable that treaty parties deviated from the almost 60 years specific diplomatic practice of controversy avoidance, which have enabled parties to reach consensus. They condemned in the strongest possible terms Russia's unjustifiable, unprovoked and illegal war of one consultative state, state against another. The overwhelming majority of the parties expressed their strong support for Ukraine and aligned themselves with the demarche to the Russian delegation demanding Russia to stop the war against Ukraine. The meeting also agreed not to continue intersessional discussions initiated and moderated by Russia. As individual sanction, the United States decided to denunciate the joint memorandum of understanding between the governments of the United States and the Russian Federation on Cooperation in Antarctica, under which was held one and only joint Antarctic inspection. Ukrainian delegation called on parties to initiate discussions over the proper response of the Antarctic community to the Russia's aggression. To this end, further steps of parties to respond could include, but not limited to, depriving the Russian Federation of its right to vote in future TSM, rejecting any initiative made by the Russian Federation, terminating ongoing joint projects with Russia, and refusing to purchase service from or supply service to the Russia or other actors directly or indirectly affiliated with the Russian Federation. Other known action made by individual states outside ATSM includes closing down the use of a Russian vessel by New Zealand Antarctic Tourism Company. Moreover, Russia largely conducts its national program logistics to and from Antarctica via air and shipping routing through South Africa. So South African restriction on the use of its facilities may be a powerful break on Russian Antarctic activities, particularly given the expectation that other Antarctic gateway states may be expected not to offer alternate facilities. In this regard, if the aggression will continue, the isolation measures, such as re rejecting any Russian initiatives and terminated ongoing joint projects with the Russian Federation, will increase the risk to achieve Russia's diplomatic, research, fishery and logistic activities in the Antarctic area, until the situation allows for continuation of such cooperation. To conclude, the military aggression of one Antarctic Treaty Party against another have a destructive effect on its national Antarctic program and requires a consolidated response from the Antarctic community. It is expected that unprecedented deviation of Treaty Party's diplomatic practice of controversy avoidance, their strong support for Ukraine and demarche to the Russian delegation will affect to further work of other Antarctic-related administration and management bodies such as Kamala, Kamnap, SCA and IATO. The global scientific community shall support Ukrainian scientists who have been placed at risk or became displaced by this war by providing them opportunities to continue their work and realize that Russian partners may be under sanctions and national and institutional restrictions until the situation allows for continuation, the cooperation as usual. Thank you for your attention. I would be happy to answer your questions in chat box or please keep my emails to continue conversation. Take care, stand with Ukraine and have a nice day. Thank you, Andrei. Again, that was uh, perfectly on time. And as he said, although the uh, the presentation was recorded, uh, Andre is with us, uh, so you may ask uh, whatever you want in the chat or at the very end.
So we'll move on with our presentations. Next in line is Elias Angele from the University of Bremen. And Elias will be talking about red herrings and negotiation of the Antarctic Treaty and the Soviet Union. Elias, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. I think, uh, I hope you can hear me okay uh, and see my presentation. So um, a little bit of history about the negotiation of the Antarctic Treaty and the Soviet Union. Uh, now, I dare say that the Antarctic Treaty has not been overly celebrated as a successful attempt of an anti-communist alliance to contain their common enemy. It's just a few headlines you're all very familiar with, I'm sure. Nowadays, the treaty uh, serves rather as an example of a splendid but admittedly rare incident in Cold War history in which mutual understanding and support between the superpowers had become reality. Now, in my dissertation, I am analyzing the role of the Soviet Union in shaping the Antarctic knowledge regime. And in this, I am concentrating first and foremost uh, on aspects of knowledge exchange, which has, of course, been one of the most celebrated features of the internationalized continent. And the following, I'd like to try and touch on five aspects of the historical reality of the treaty's evolution that have been less emphasized. Because if one focuses on the role of the Soviet Union in the process that led to the conclusion of the treaty, it becomes clear that a set of conflicting rather than common interests gave the treaty its specific shape. Now, that is not to say that the Antarctic Treaty is not a remarkable thing. Quite on the contrary, it was what the US diplomat Alan Nidal called, I quote, the first, limiting, the first treaty limiting the military activities of the Soviet Union in any significant way after the Second World War. It seems fair, therefore, to ask why the USSR should have had an interest in curtailing the aspirations to gain significant dominance over the Southern Hemisphere through expanding to Antarctica. Now, since it is almost impossible to access the relevant Soviet documents in Russian archives and uh, the current situation doesn't particularly help, I must say, I argue on the basis of mostly British reports and Soviet publications, which I think help to gain significant insight into the historical processes nonetheless. So coming to my first point, uh, the treaty as an anti-communist alliance. Now the International Geophysical Year started with the Soviet Union showing an effort that was second only to the tremendous program of the United States of America. In hindsight, it seems that uh, inviting the USSR to the negotiating table had been unavoidable. However, it was very much against the will of, uh, for example, the Australian government, since most of the Soviet IGY activities in Antarctica were located in the sector claimed by them. The Australians went out of their way to make the Soviets leave after the official end of the IGY, and they were trying to put as much pressure as possible on the other claimant states and the USA. They were even willing to head off international resolutions to create SCAR, because it was thought to provide an unfavorable incentive for the Soviets to stay. Now, in the end, however, none of these attempts worked. The USSR had established a firm basis in Antarctica and outstripped most of their competitors. With the second SCAR meeting planned to be in Moscow in the summer of 1958, it had become fully clear that the Soviets were going to stay. Nobody was willing or had the means to forcefully evict the ideological enemy, so the only way was to sit down and talk. Coming to my second point, the framework of the treaty would work only if the USSR would be included. Brian Roberts, for instance, Antarctic biologist and member of the British Foreign Office Research Department, understood that it had become impossible to keep the continent for themselves. I quote, the UK cannot possibly keep the US and the USSR out of the Antarctic, so it should not incur the odium of appearing to do so. Therefore, it was better to embrace their competitors and try to bind them to a legal framework which would reduce the potential damage of a Soviet presence in the Southern Hemisphere. The American lawyer Herman Fledger, who would serve as the chairman of the Antarctic Conference later on, echoed this thought when stating that their primary interest was to keep the continent demilitarized. This was going to work only if there was an agreement with the USSR. Coming to my third point, Soviet Union and the new foreign policy guideline of peaceful coexistence. Above all, the willingness of the Soviet government to negotiate the Antarctic Treaty is directly linked, I would like to argue, to the major shift in its foreign policy under Stalin's successor, Nikita Khrushchev, 
who modified the Stalinist doctrine of the inevitability of war between capitalist and socialist countries to the at least superficially less militarist version of so-called peaceful coexistence. Uh, on the occasion of the 20th Party Congress in February 1956, Khrushchev not only officially broke with Stalin's cult of personality, but also tried to reestablish international relations with the ideological enemy. Now, in this new spirit of peaceful coexistence, Khrushchev started to visit the West, an effort that the historian Sergei Radchenko called a uh, charm offensive. And the General Secretary's first travel destination was Great Britain in April 1956. Uh, it seems important to mention that Soviet science profited directly from this change of attitude since it broke a long period of abstinence from global scientific exchange. In effect, peaceful coexistence made a Soviet participation in the IGY possible in the first place. Coming to my fourth point, from obstructive to constructive behavior. When the preparatory meetings for a potential conference in Antarctica began in Washington DC in June 1958, a positive outcome did not seem very likely. The Soviet delegation showed no particular interest in negotiating any matter of substance Instead, blocking every attempt to talk about anything meaningful. They took a tough stance on some of the basic strategic elements of the Western countries, which entailed uh, first and foremost, a so-called freezing clause, which uh, would guarantee that every claim made could not be challenged while remaining ineffective at the same time. Another goal was the limiting of the convening countries to an absolute minimum. Both principles were attacked by the Soviet Union right away. When they proposed that other countries should be informed of and probably be invited to the talks, all the other participants were opposed to the idea. A UK official described in clear terms what would happen if more countries were allowed to enter the negotiations. If they would say yes to one aspirant, others would follow, thus risking to be outnumbered by Soviet friendly countries in the long run. India had been pressing the issue in particular since they had first addressed an internationalization scheme under the auspices of the United Nations since 1956. And the USSR was the only one to favor this approach, thus keeping in line with their general policy towards post-colonial states, which they had been pursuing for a while already. In 1957, just to give you an, another example, the Soviets had tried to bring India and the GDR into the Atomic Energy um, Conference in Geneva which had equally been categorically rejected by all the other participants. Now, the preparatory talks for the Antarctic Treaty seemed to repeat this kind of story. Um, this behavior evoked considerable stress in the delegations of the Western countries who tried to keep the Soviets in the negotiation process at all costs. Even when contemplating very detailed questions like uh, the zone of application of the treaty and whether ice shelves could be included in the definition of the treaty area, the above mentioned Brian Roberts was anxious that the somewhat arbitrary definitions of different ice formations, I quote, could easily become a major red herring if the Russians want yet another one. By that, he was commenting on the obstructive behavior of the Soviet delegation to hinder the preparatory meetings to progress toward any practical solution. Now, another reason for the Soviet attempts to slow down the negotiating process revealed itself during uh, the second meeting of SCAR in Moscow in August 1958, when a Polish delegation formally presented its application to membership. With another socialist country active in Antarctica, it would have been more difficult to deny entry to the treaty negotiations since the other participating non-claimant states had been granted admission on the same grounds, that is Belgium, Japan, and South Africa. However, the application of the Polish uh, was premature. Poland had clearly been pushed by the Soviets to establish a scientific program, which was nevertheless at an early stage. And the Polish delegate therefore could do little more than present a research program for the forthcoming season. And it became clear that they did not meet the standards for SCAR membership yet. Although at least secretly, the US were ready to accept the Polish participation in order to keep the Soviets in the process. But the letter did not push the matter. Instead, in early 1959, they started to seriously contribute to the discussions 
and were eager to agree on as much as possible before the actual conference. And this was very much to the surprise of the other delegates, who in part were rather suspicious of the sudden change of attitude. Henry Henke of the British Foreign Office summarized, I quote, it is conceivable that the Russians are deliberately trying to lull us into a state of false security and intend to embarrass us when the conference meets. Unquote. However, nothing of that sort came true. This was above all due to one man, Grigory Ivanovich Tunkin, whose uh, publications you can see on this slide. Although the Antarctic Treaty was signed by Vasily Kuznetsov, most of the negotiations were led by Tunkin, whose charismatic appearance and high competence impressed the other delegations deeply. When looking at Tonkin's publications as a major Soviet expert on international law, it becomes clear that the overall aim was to turn Antarctica into a primary example of peaceful coexistence. In fact, in the same year of the 20th Party Congress, that is 1956, Tonkin had published on the matter, sort of translating Khrushchev's statements into the terminology of international law. In this article, he consequently stressed the necessity of a parallel existence of incommensurable societal structures who would and should cooperate nevertheless. In his other book, Ideological Struggle and International Law, one can see that the only reason why this kind of arrangement was favorable in the first place came from Tonkin's teleological worldview, according to which it was a law of societal evolution that socialism would ultimately succeed over its competitors. Their achievements during the IGY seemed to prove him right. With uh, Khrushchev further pursuing his charm offensive and traveling to the United States in September 1959, the conference was held at a very fortunate moment. The Soviets were clearly willing to agree on a treaty, and the British head of delegation exclaimed joyfully that the Soviets have displayed a degree of tolerance and cooperation, which I should imagine must be rare in the annals of international conferences in recent years." End quote. Eventually, all the signatory parties were able to agree on a treaty that in the eyes of, the Herm of uh, Herman Fledger secured the non-militarization of the continent and the British were able to settle their decade long dispute over the conflicting claims with Argentina and Chile. So coming uh, to my fifth and last point. Great. Uh, none of the representatives were going so far as to make this a precedent for the rest of the world as the British diplomat Richard Parsons remarked after having read the official Soviet statement. Uh, it is interesting that the Russians, like ourselves, have avoided actually saying that the principles of the Antarctic Treaty are suitable for immediate application elsewhere. With the Cuban Missile Crisis that followed shortly after, the application of the treaty principles to other parts of the world seemed as distant as never before. And I'll stop right here and I'm looking forward to uh, your comments and remarks. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Elias. So we're moving on to our next to last speaker, Luis Valentin Cerrada from the Universidad de Chile. Luis Valentin is going to present on protecting the Antarctic biodiversity through an environmental liability regime, where we are. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Alejandra. Good morning, good evening for everyone. The outline of my presentation is shown in the, in the screen. I will talk uh, just a, a few words because of the time about the greening of the Antarctic Treaty System, uh, about the legal duties and breaches in, in this concern, uh, about the liability regime and some conclusions at the end. Greening the Antarctic Treaty System have at least two meanings. Uh, this picture is about Antarctica, is King George Island, and it's green, it's green because of the climate change. And this is, of course, uh, a reason of a very big concern uh, of the, the, all the people who work in, in this area. But greening the Antarctic Treaty system means at the same time, in a more uh, positive way, uh, the evolution of the Antarctic Treaty system uh, to the concern and, and, and act in, in the sense of the environmental protection. Uh, and in normative way, you have some uh, norms that you need to understand and, and study and, and analyze to understand this, this move um, from more geopolitical uh, objectives, but 
where in, in the Article 9.1.F of the Antarctic Treaty is the, the seed of, of this uh, movement uh, to the environmental protocol and of course uh, the two main uh, other convention of the Antarctic system, the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Seals and even more important, the Convention for the Conservation of Antarctic Living Marine Resources. Uh, this evolution or in this evolution, the Antarctic biodiversity, uh, of course, is uh, increasing its importance. The, the word itself, biodiversity, is not used in these instruments, but uh, if you consider what's the meaning of the word, uh, of course, uh, at the time is, is passing, the, the importance of the living uh, resources, animals, even plants uh, in the Antarctica uh, and all the ecosystem and the, the balance of this ecosystem take more importance uh, every day. Uh, legal duties and breach about uh, environmental <laughs> matters, it's very important because always is the question about what happens if someone don't fulfill the rules. Uh, the Antarctic system have several rules about uh, the environmental protection, mainly, of course, in, in, the, in the protocol, but even in other uh, instruments, you have some rules in that. But what happens if someone don't fulfill this uh, specific rules agreed? I think we need to, to see at least in two areas. Um, first, what happened in the ground. Uh, and in the ground, we have a system of infection and control uh, as such as possible because, of course, the, the, the Antarctic continent and the surrounding sea, the uh, southern ocean, is a, a huge area. Then any control is very difficult to implement. But at the same time, we have a lot of problem of jurisdiction uh, from the legal point of view then it's not easy to make this, this control. Anyway, we have some tools, some legal tools, some uh, articles, some uh, competence for different uh, countries uh, or the Antarctic Treaty parties uh, that can control or make mutual inspection. And in this manner, uh, they can review, they can check uh, if all the rules are being uh, fulfilled or not. In, in the law, uh, we have a, a, big res a big instrument, which is called responsibility in more broader terms and in more political terms also, and liability that is uh, very familiar to the responsibility, but have more to do with uh, pay for, for the damage that someone make or for the consequence. Uh, of uh, his actions. Uh, in the Antarctic system, in the Convention of the Seals and in the Camelar, we have some rules of responsibility, but we don't have proper rules about liability. The first rules about liability are in the Convention for Mineral Resources. As you know, uh, this convention is not enforced, but Article 8 of this convention have a very good development of the, the liability and probably we need to read again uh, this, this norm. Uh, the Antarctic uh, Treaty Parties agreed in the protocol in the Article 16, uh, the compromise to elaborate these rules of liability for Antarctic damage, uh, environmental damage. Uh, but the only result of that is the negotiation of Annex 6 uh, of, the, of the protocol. And still, it's not enforced, then it's not a, a real legal rule. And we will be a bit in, in that. The negotiation of the Annex 6 of the environmental protocol have three phases uh, a preliminary phase. Um, just in the time uh, after the, the protocol was negotiated, uh, then have 
two main phases. The, the first one uh, was concentrated in, in the agreed or, or tried to agree uh, an uh, Antarctic environmental comprehensive protection. This was uh, leading by Professor Rudolf Gulfrum from Germany. Uh, and I believe that uh, the information paper 43 from the United States in 1996 make the breaking point to uh, the last phase about the liability for um, the environmental emergencies. Uh, this is a more restrict um, liability regime. Uh, the, the result of all this process is that the, from the idea of the comprehensive environmental protection, what is said in uh, Article 16 of the protocol, uh, the negotiation will produce at the end a weak liability regime which only cover the reimbursement of reasonable cost by a uh, home sober taking response action. That is more than Article 16 about the Article 15 of the, of the protocol. But this is not only the problem, the, the change in, in the regime and that is less, uh, less, uh, important that we expect about that at the same time at the same time when after the, the next six was adopted in 2005 uh, we have been a very slow process of approval of this annex uh, the annex need uh, 28 approval to entry into force uh, but as you can see in the in the picture now we have only 19 of this approval and we don't know really when we'll finish this process. In, in some points, you can see between year uh, 2012, 2015 or 14, uh, we have a lot of countries, a lot of parties uh, approving this, this annex. But after that, we have a very slow, process and really we it's impossible to know when we finish this this process but at the same time and, and this i think is very important to consider also the last time that we uh, discussed in the antarctic treaty meeting um uh, liability liability formally uh, was in 2001 uh, uh, that's mean that in the last two decades, we have talking about what happened with Annex Six. Have a that have a, a narrow uh, scope about liability, but we have not discussed again the big issue about the liability for the match in in in, in Antarctica. Uh, this year, uh, the parties agree that they will think if they will restart the negotiation just in three years ahead. My conclusions for this very fast review of, of the process uh, are that always, and especially in the climate change uh, era, of course, that they protecting the Antarctic ecosystem and its biodiversity, is essential for the preserving the life on the earth at, at a wall. In the last decades, the Antarctic Treaty System has shown its concern for protecting this fragile environment, but it's not enough. As we can show, there are some rules, there are some political agreements, there are some legal rules agreed, but the implementation of that or, or how is the, the real um, the, the, the real useful and, and, and the real uh, application of this rule uh, can be uh, debatable. And finally, liability is a helpful legal tool to improve 
the legal of care of the people have to employ in their activities in Antarctica, but it has not been properly developed. Antar uh, Annex 6 cover only a part of the liability regime agreed by Article 16 of the protocol, and even worse, it is not still in force. And it's unclear when the negotiation for a more comprehensive liability regime will restart. Then we, we have a lot of work to do uh, in, in the academic field to, to push for this discussion. And of course, in the political legal uh, field in the Antarctic Treaty consultative meeting, uh, the delegates of our country have a lot of work to do. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I need to, to thanks to University of Chile, uh, U Antarctica, the, the research line about uh, Antarctic legal and political aspect of the Faculty of Law of the University of Chile, and of course the Institute, uh, the Millennium Institute of uh, Biodiversity, uh, Antarctic and Subantarctic Ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luis Valentin. Perfect. So we have one more presentation today, and then uh, we'll have Linda's two last slides. So. Uh, I think we'll have some time for that and then we'll move to the Q&A. Okay, so as promised, I think we'll have Lynn to show her last two slides uh, and then, okay, so we've reached the end and now it's time for Q&A. Patrick is going to take over for the chairing now. So please just raise your virtual hands if you have a question and it has to be quick fire questions. So very quick uh, and, uh, uh, questions and answers, please. So we'll leave time for everyone. That's right. Thank you, Alejandra. Um, please ask your questions either in um, the um, question and, and answers section or raise your hand and I, I can grant you speaking rights, so to speak. Um, just from, uh, and Alejandra has raised her hand already just a second there. Um, Jan, had, oh, Jan, sorry, had noted um, in addition um, to, um, sorry, uh, to Anita's presentation that Canada's application to ComNet has been accepted. So just to add to that, and then the first question is already um, in the question and answer section by Daniela. Um, she um, asks Lewis about the limits to liability in Annex 6, which are already outdated. The question is, do you think that Annex 6 should be first amended in order to speed up its implementation in remaining countries or do you believe this delay has other reasons? Therefore, any amendment should be done after Annex 6 enters into force. Um, Luis, do you have a, uh, a response to that? Yes, I, I, I have some ideas about that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniela. I, I think the point is the, a view more idealistic and, and a view more realistic. Uh, from the idealistic point of view, of course, I believe that the Annex 6 have to be modernized and updated uh, before it's entry into force. And indeed, I, I have some critics about the, the, the Annex itself. But in the realistic point, or from the realistic point of view, uh, it's clear that with this weak regime of liability, the country have not be um, disposed to, to, to give the approval is even more difficult that they approve a more strict re re liability regime. And in this way, I think that the practical uh, approach of that is advanced as fast as possible in the approval of this annex and in parallel maybe to, to start as soon as possible again uh, the negotiation of the complementation or a new annex or some reformation of, of, of this reliability regime. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Luis Valentin, for a very uh, quick uh, answer as well. Um, we have Alejandra uh, next. She has raised her hand. So please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I have a question for Charlene. So uh, you talked about 
the political interest in uh, declaring the Weddell Sea as a marine protected area. And I was, uh, I would like to hear more about it. So could you spell that out? What is the political interest about exactly? And then I had a question that it goes uh, both for Linda and Charlene and maybe also Jung Chul. Uh, I would like to have your views on this balance between rational use versus conservation because you all talked about that. Uh, but how how do you think that this balance is uh, being kept now and do you have any ideas or do you have any views on what will happen in the near future? Thank you. I think I will start um, with the question. Um, you ask if, well, so what are the political interests in specific? Does, did I get it right? Yes. Okay. Um, Actually, I do not have an answer to this because um, the um, free text comments from the participants um, were not specific enough um, for political interests. So they mainly talked about what are their scientific uh, research interests or what are their um, fishing interests, but not really on political matters uh, in specific but I still want to find that out actually. Good. Yeah, I, I was curious because the other two are pretty obvious, but what is in there? What is in the political? What comprises yeah, exact, the political? Exactly. <laughs> um, perhaps I could um, help answer that a little bit, um, uh, Alessandra. Um, the political interest is uh, primarily from Russia is primarily potential for fishing in the future in the Weddell Sea, um, simply because it's not currently uh, mapped from a fishing perspective and they expect that there will be fishing there. So they want to keep it aside in case there is at some point. If that makes sense. Yes, I, I can <laughs> agree to me like that. a fishing interest, but yeah, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. So, so I... I do agree to this. Um, this is what they also said, but it, it's mainly a fishing interest. So I, I put that in the category of fishing interest, not specific mm -hmm. as political interest. Yeah, okay. But it, it sounds uh, yeah like a point. Yeah. So could, should I answer the my view on the balance between conservation and rational use? Yeah, I, as I said in my um, presentation, the, uh, the majority of members read the objective of the convention as being conservation of marine living resources defined as pretty much everything, not just fish, um, fishable um, species, but all organisms, including birds. And then that includes rational use, but is not limited to rational use. If the rational use is undertaken according to specific rules that are spelt out in the same article too. Um, in that context, they believe that uh, you have conservation um, and you can have rational use if it meets those rules within um, under conservation. Other members, I mean, it's a very small group of countries, call that balance business as meaning that you have to balance, you have to have conservation uh, measures alongside of rational use. And that's not how the the majority of members or even a legal view would view the objective. Um, and I think that, that that is the cause of the divergent views and the challenges that Kamala is currently facing. Um, and that is because a small number of countries wish the convention to be primarily seen as a fisheries regime because they don't want to constrain both fishing activities now and into the future. That's the short version Thanks, of my Len. view. Terrific. Yeah. Um, and Hyung Chol, um, I think, did you? Well, yeah. I think, um, let's say, uh, I, I, I don't know how to put this, but let's say some small group of countries that who believe there should be a balance. I, I don't think this is a matter for like which one should be prevailing by how, mu how many person like uh, 
uh, conservation should be 90% and rational use can be only 10%. I think the problem is the degree of uh, proof. I think that's where the divergent views are beginning. So um, how precautionary is precautionary enough? So those are the, the points where diverge, divergent views are uh, coming to kick in. And I don't think those countries are necessarily trying to remove those, um, have only fishery related menu on the table. I don't think it is a fair description. Well, th that's where I can stop. Okay, thank you, Young mm. Chua. Mm. Um, I have next here a question um, from Cherin um, for Anita, I guess. If Canada's interest in the Antarctic affairs is based on gaining more foothold in polar science and political reasons, why would Canada's application for consultative party status not necessarily mean that Canada will expand its investment in Antarctic science and infrastructure? Thank you for this question. Before that, thank you, Jan, for confirming that Canada has been accepted as a full member of COMNAP. That's great to hear. Um, and uh, with regard to the question on investments, I think it's still early days. We have seen, as I mentioned, and it was towards the end of the talk, that Polar did recently announce uh, four doctoral uh, scholarships worth ten thousand uh, dollars each for Antarctic research, but these are sort of probably small investments. But one hopes that in the next few years we will see some uh, evidence of probably more um, a sort of directed funding on Antarctic research and certainly its application to consultative party status uh, definitely justifies that uh, kind of move. move. But I think uh, we have to see, uh, there's nothing yet in the horizon. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis that Canada is placing on these cooperative frameworks with other countries uh, where the, the Arctic, Antarctic bipolar linkages in terms of carrying out scientific uh, research uh, does uh, take precedence. Uh, but in terms of, as I say, in terms of investment, it is uh, really, we, we've got to see what transpires in the next uh, few years. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Anita. I just saw that um, Andre is um, heading off, I had a question for him. I just wanted to ask him and his colleagues who are attending as well, how they're doing at the moment um, and whether they're actually able to do any of the important Arctic science work. I'm not sure whether he's able to answer that question or whether he is off already. Andre, are you still there? I don't think so. Yes, yes uh, I'm still oh, here. Oh yeah, you are, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Good to see you. Uh, good to see all of you too. Uh, well, so uh, how we are now in Ukraine? Mm. Uh, we try to be optimistic, if in short. Uh, many countries, uh, many national Antarctic programs uh, express their support for us, for polar people. Uh, and um, some scientists uh, got grant and uh, some of them are now working in, uh, in Europe. It's very useful for, for them because uh, for some um, poor scientists, uh, they, um, they have no, no way to return because uh, some homes and, or, and Ukrainian universities are partly or fully destroyed now. So we really need uh, any kind of uh, support from our international colleagues. So thank you, thank you all, thank you all, all of them who, who support us. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time and I won't keep you any longer. Um, take care. Thank okay, you. great. Um, so I, I have a, another hand raised by Elias. Do you want to ask your question, Elias? Yeah, there's a quick question for uh, Hugo about the Madrid Protocol effectiveness. Uh, I was wondering, if you could elaborate a little more on the hidden agendas of uh, countries, because you were referring to that one, and uh, 
Could you possibly give an example? Thank you. Uh, yes, hello, Elias. Thank you for the question. Um, hidden agendas are uh, the motives that leads the countries to do something that they want to hide. Uh, so uh, it's very uh, common to a, a party to say that they are uh, interesting in conserving or protecting the environment, but uh, they are behind this, this speech, they are interested in economic reasons, for example, they are interested in other things. Um, for example, my, uh, mineral uh, resources or something. Uh, for example, there is uh, a country may uh, request uh, uh, the establishment of a protected area, area an ASPA, uh, just for uh, uh, close the, the, the movement there, so it can be uh, uh, free to free uh, to explore or to to find some mineral resources there, even if it's uh, prohibited by the Madrid Protocol. So uh, it is very uh, uh, common that some countries uh, say that it, it, they are interested in, in protecting the environment, but they really are interested in economic reasons, not just uh, in this case, but uh, in most of environmental uh, agreements around the world. Okay, thank you. Um, Hyung Chol, you have your hand raised. Yeah. 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 Can I have a quick question for Hugo? Sure. So, what what cases or what material did you actually use or study to see the performance of Madrid protocol or to see its efficacy? What was the material you looked at? Yes, uh, as I said, I, I used uh, the, the data that were collected uh, was the, uh, the meetings uh, reports and uh, uh, the information papers that uh, were presented at the ATCM and CEP's reunions. Uh, I also did interviews with key actors like uh, ATCM and CEP's staff, uh, the secretariat staff, uh, some countries delegate uh, and some researchers and experts and uh, I read a lot of published paper about uh, the conservation of the uh, Antarctic environment. And I also did a, a, a participant observation at the 2016 HCMCP. Right. Okay. Great, did, do you have a follow-up question on that, Xiong Chou? Or is that, is that all right? No, yeah. That's good, okay, cool. So we have two more minutes. If there are any, any further quick fire questions, we might be able to add some quick fire answers to them as well. Alejandra, do you have a question? Well, I have many, but I don't think we'll fit them in the two minutes. So I, I'm happy to wrap up here and thank everyone actually. But if there is any very quick question, yeah, there's still some time. Doesn't seem to be the case. No, <laughs> everyone must be tired. Those that woke up too early and those that are staying up too late. <laughs> so understandably so. But yeah, maybe it's time to thank everyone for sticking to the time allotted. That was very good. And for the good questions and yeah, everything ran smoothly in the end, even though we had some trouble with the video at the beginning. I don't know if Patrick has anything to add. Um, I don't, other than, than um, to thank everyone for their really thoughtful presentations and their kind answers to the questions. It's a great panel. Um, and yeah, take care. See you all soon. Take care. In a, yes. in a, in a, thank in thank real to sense, you for the organization. Uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.